Emotions are part of our lives. They make up who we are and how God wired us to live. Emotions can be our greatest strengths when under control or our worst weaknesses when left unchecked. They can limit our potential and even enslave our lives. With God's help, we can master our emotions and learn to live in emotional freedom. It's God's Word that helps us to keep calm and get a grip. Good morning, good morning, church family. What a great joy to be together this morning and continue that series called Get a Grip, Living in Emotional Freedom. Over the last six weeks, we've been looking at how it is through God's Word that we find freedom in the depths of our soul through our emotions. Hey, one reminder, we are two weeks away from Easter weekend. It's on April Fool's Day. But I just encourage you to be praying about who it is that you could invite to Sugar Creek on Easter weekend because statistics say that 70% of those people that would not go to church on any other weekend will come if you invite them on Easter weekend. And so we believe for lives to be changed and for transformation to happen in the heart and soul of people. So I just encourage you to bring somebody with you all across our campuses, all across our services on Easter weekend. Last week we talked about regret. And over the last several weeks, we've identified some key emotions in our life. Wonderful emotions, needed emotions, and necessary emotions of life when it's kept under control. But with all these emotions we've identified, the truth is that if we lose control of our emotions, they'll gain control of us. We've all had moments where we've lost it. And it's been regretful even in the consequences we immediately saw after it. And today, we want to address the real vivid emotion of fear. Fear. Now, not all fear is bad, just like not all stress is bad. Sometimes fear can keep you safe and from danger. Just a few weeks ago, our less than two-year-old daughter, Avery, decided that the crib just wasn't her thing anymore. <laughs> Sleep in the crib, that's not, I'm too, I'm too old for that. So one night, unbeknownst to us, she rolled up her blanket, stuffed her teddy bear on top of her blanket and used it as a stepping stone and climbed out of the crib. Our crib is pretty tall and to this day, I have no idea how she lowered herself, but she did. And she walked through a pitch dark hallway, took a right turn and then another right and landed at our bedroom door at 1 a.m. Either she's really smart or we, we are really just bad parents. I'm not sure which of the either is true. But I wish she had a little bit more fear. Fear can keep us from danger. It's good to have a holy fear of God. Fear can keep us from making bad choices because we're afraid of its consequences. But today I want to talk to you about the fear that not just keeps you from danger, but the fear that keeps you from progress. The fear that keeps you from taking that next step forward in the life that God calls you to. The fear that says you're not good enough, you don't have what it takes, you've been through that path before and look where it's ended you up in. That fear that paralyzes our life from that extraordinary life God calls you and I to. There was a man who lived about 3,300 years ago. He grew up in a pretty powerful, influential family. Had everything given to him from wealth, influence, power, education, training, all that you can imagine. But one day he realized that who he thought he was was not who he was. This led him to rage and an act of violence that he could not take back. So he ran for his life, knowing that he has been found out. He ran into the wilderness and for 40 years, this man lived hidden from the rest of the world, looking backwards over his shoulders to make sure that no one was coming for him. He picked up a new identity, a new career, and even a new family, all out of fear. He wanted to make sure that no one knew who he was, and soon he himself forgot who he was. Stripped of all confidence, rid of all ambition, removed from all purpose, but full of fear. He went from royalty to obscurity, prominence to now poverty. This man that I'm describing to you is who we know as Moses, the great Moses. When we think about Moses, this is usually the picture that comes to our mind, the great Charlton Heston Moses, the receiver of the Ten Commandments, the deliverer of the Israelites, the 
splitter of the Red Sea. But rarely do we think about Moses in these terms of being a shepherd at the age of 80. Because did you know that for 40 years, Moses lived in Midian as a shepherd, like shown in this next picture here. He lived out of obscurity. He lived taking care of sheep. Not only his sheep, or actually he didn't have any sheep. He lived taking care of his father-in-law's sheep. Now, it's bad enough to be a shepherd. But to watch over somebody else's sheep for 40 years is even worse. Because what it means is that you haven't acquired any wealth. You don't possess any land. You don't own anything. And you're serving to somebody else the rest of your life. Moses is an 80-year-old man living with his in-laws in the middle of nowhere, all out of great fear. Uh, life hasn't worked out for him the way he hoped. Had great aspirations, great hopes of what he would end up doing. But the rest of his life, until the age of 80, lived in obscurity. We read in Exodus 2 what led him to Midian in verse 14 and 15. It says, then Moses became afraid and thought, what I did is certainly known. When Pharaoh heard about this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian. What drove Moses into the desert, into the wilderness was fear, legitimate fear, because his life was in danger. But long after Pharaoh was dead and gone, Moses is still running and hiding in fear. What was supposed to be a temporary escape route became his permanent home. What was supposed to be a season became his settlement. And the fear that protected him from danger now possibly could keep him from destiny. I wonder today as you're sitting in this room or watching online, where has fear brought you to? What have you ran away from? Or ran into? What have you settled for? A less than ideal life. Less than the extraordinary life that God calls you to. Where has fear brought you to this morning? Maybe you're a single parent and you fear that you don't have enough to give to your child. Maybe you're a student here and you wonder if you'll ever achieve greatness. Maybe you are a young adult single and you wonder if you'll ever meet that person to spend the rest of your life and you're afraid of loneliness. Maybe you're an older adult and you've just received a terrible diagnosis and you're afraid of what tomorrow holds. You're afraid of that next appointment. You're afraid about what the remaining of your life entails. One day in Exodus chapter 3, on an ordinary day, Moses, Moses found himself in an extraordinary encounter. We find out in this scene that we're going to look at today in detail the Moses is at the far side of the wilderness in Midian. The far side of the wilderness. What that means is that he has had a really, really rough day. He's been searching for pasture the whole day to feed Jethro's sheep, but has found none. And now he is literally at the edge of the wilderness, nowhere else to go trying to feed someone else's sheep. And in this last resort, when he's at the end of his rope, he finds himself at Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. I just love the fact that when we are at the end of our ropes to our last resort, having nothing else to give, nowhere else to turn to, that's usually an incredible meeting place with God. That's where God finds us and begins to speak and deal specifically to us. So as Moses finds himself at the edge of the wilderness as an 80-year-old man, he sees something astonishing, a bush that is burning without being burned. Whoa, what could that be? But there's something even more remarkable than that. Out of the bush came the voice of God. God began to speak through the burning bush. Now this is remarkable because it's been 400 years since anyone has heard the voice of God. The children of Israel have been in slavery, but also in silence from God. Moses has never heard the voice of God, but now in obscurity, God begins to speak to Moses. God calls him by name, Moses, Moses, which signified urgency and intimacy. And this is what God says to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. So because the Israelites cry for help has come to me, and I have also seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them, therefore you go, therefore go. 
I am sending you to Pharaoh so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. God comes to Moses and says, I have seen, I have heard, I know the suffering of my people. Their cry has reached to me. Therefore, I need you to go and deliver my people out of Egypt. And these are the very words that all of Israel has been begging God for. God, will you intervene? God, will you rescue us from this slavery? This was the very passion of Moses 40 years ago that led him to do all that he did. So I would imagine that the hearing of this once upon a lifetime kind of opportunity, once in a fourth century kind of opportunity, Moses would be so eager and excited to say yes to the mission. Finally, my 40 years of obscurity is over. Finally, I can have meaning and purpose again. Finally, I can be a part of something worthwhile. But that is not how Moses responds to God's great call. Instead of responding to God's call with a hearty yes, Moses responds with five glaring excuses to why he could not do what God called him to do. Five excuses why he could not be the person, do the task, the mission that God called him to do. But these five excuses stem from five of our greatest fears that not only Moses had, but you have and I have. Five of our fears that we respond to when we hear the call of God to an extraordinary life. When God tells us to start that small business or go back to school. When God calls us to serve in ministry or to lead a mission trip. When God calls us to something beyond our comfort zones. We too, like Moses, respond with these excuses based out of fear. The first excuse that Moses gives to God comes out of his fear of identity. Fear of identity. This fear says that I am a nobody. I'm not cut off for this. I am a nobody. Notice what Moses says in verse 11 of chapter 3 in Exodus. But Moses asked God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I? Pharaoh, at that time, is the most powerful man in the world. He is known to some as God on earth. He is protected by a vast army. People have literally died for going and approaching Pharaoh. So Moses is thinking to himself, I'm an 80-year-old man. For the last 40 years, I've seen nothing but sheep. They probably have a death warrant on my life still in Egypt. Why would I go to Pharaoh? What he's saying is this, there is no way that someone like me could do something like what you're asking me to do. No way. Someone like me could do something like what God, you're asking me to do. This was my response on December 15th, 2007. When I heard God's call to ministry so clearly, I responded with, no way, not me. There's somebody surely more fit. Somebody else you can send. Not me, God. And usually when God calls us to an extraordinary life, we have a great personal profile that we inform God with. God, have you seen the list of things I've done? Have you seen all of the reasons why I should be disqualified from what you're calling me to? Have you seen this, God? God simply responds, responds to Moses' objection by saying to Moses, Moses, I will be with you. I will be with you. And you think that would settle the issue for the great Moses, but it does not. He is just getting started with his excuses. The next excuse he comes to God with is the fear of the, the fear of, uh, I mean, the fear of the unknown. The fear of the unknown. The fear of the unknown says, I don't know what to say. I wouldn't know what to do. Notice what he says to God in verse 13. Then Moses asked God, if I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me, and they ask me, what is his name? What should I say? What should I tell them? God, I'm not prepared to answer the questions they might have. I don't even know your name. Sometimes we feel that prompting to share Christ with somebody or to invite someone to church and we immediately think of, well, what if they go all apologetics on me and philosophical on me? I wouldn't know what to say. The fear of the unknown. But God says to this to Moses, Moses, all you need to know is my name. I am who I am. I am who I am. You don't need to know anything else. You just need to know me. You don't have to have figured it all out. You just need to know my character and know my nature. 
the fear of the unknown. Third, Moses responds with the fear of others. First he asked God, who are you? Who am I? Then he asked God, who are you? Now he points to all of the others and said, God, what if they don't believe me? What if I say to them all of these things and they don't believe me and they doubt that you have appeared to me? Look, I can imagine Moses saying, look, God, you and I have had this encounter. We had this burning bush, but they haven't seen the burning bush. Maybe if you appear to them in a burning bush, maybe they'll hear you then. But all they have to go on is my word? No way. They'll never believe me. My coworker will never hear me out. My boss will never listen to my vision. My family will never hear what God, you've spoken to me. The fear of others. And then Moses responds with the fear of inability. The fear of inability that says, I don't have what it takes. I don't have what it takes. Notice, notice Moses' response in verse 10. But Moses replied to the Lord, please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, either in the past or recently or since you and I have been talking. Because my mouth and my tongue are sluggish. Moses is saying, God, you want me to go before the most powerful man in the world. Have you heard me talk? Have you listened in on a conversation? Do you know my physical inabilities that I can stutter? I can't speak right. I have all of these inabilities. That keep me from following your call on my life. I love God's response to Moses. God tells Moses, Moses, who gave you your mouth? That's what God says. Who gave you your mouth? It was it not I? Am I not the one that causes people to speak or causes people to be mute? Am I not the one that causes people to see or causes people to be blind? Moses, if you go, I'll teach you what to say. I'll help you. Don't let your inability be an excuse to be used by God. When I'm confronted with my own inabilities, I think about a few people in my life that I've seen or have known personally. Think about people like Joni Erickson Tata, who at the age of 17 was met with a severe diving accident, left her quadriplegic for the rest of her life. But that didn't stop her. She went on to write over 50 books, traveled to 47 countries, lived a life of purpose and meaning. She produces still the most fine detail paintings by holding a paintbrush between her teeth. I think about people like Nick Vucic, who was born without arms and without legs. But he didn't stop. He started an organization called Life Without Limbs. And through that organization, he has shared the gospel with over 670 million people, of which one million people have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. I think about my own friend, my personal friend, Philip Matthews. His parents were my youth pastors. He grew up in our church in Tennessee. He wasn't even supposed to be born. Doctor said, abort this child, he won't make it. But he was born alive. He was born with the right side of his face undeveloped, with holes in his heart, with a corpus callosum missing in his brain, with a 90 degree curve in his spine even to this day. But they decided they were not going to let his inabilities stop God from using their family. They began an organization called Love Without Reason where they travel the globe and provide free surgeries for children born like Philip. And to this date, they have provided 460 surgeries to children and taken the gospel into 4,500 villages. What did these three people do? They gave God their inability, their natural inability. And God gave them his supernatural ability. They gave God their ordinary and said, God, I don't have much, but what I have, I give to you. There are five loaves and two fish. And God multiplied it. God breathed his spirit on them and did extraordinary things that you could not have imagined. The fear of identity, the fear of the unknown, the fear of others, and the fear of our own limitations and inability. And lastly, Moses responds with the fear of failure. The fear of failure. His last excuse to God is this. In verse 13, Moses said, please, Lord, send someone else. Send somebody else. I don't really have any more good reasons, but just send someone else. I don't have what it takes. I don't know enough. I'm unable to do this. Send someone else. The fear of failure. I wonder this morning which of these excuses ring loud in your ears, in your heart, in your soul. 
which of these fears you operate in this morning? Afraid to say yes to the extraordinary things God calls you to. Afraid to take that next step forward. Billy Graham's life was celebrated just a couple of weeks ago. His legacy, his impact, reaching 215 million people with the gospel in live audiences. Incredible. But did you know that Billy Graham grew up on a dairy farm as a young teenage boy in North Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina. His job was to milk 20 cows in the morning and 20 cows in the afternoon. To shovel around fresh manure and to make sure that the feeding troughs were full of fresh hay. So when he felt God's call to ministry, he dealt with his own fears. He was called to give his first sermon on Easter weekend, 1937. He preached to 40 people. He was so afraid to write his own sermon that he borrowed somebody else's. He stood before 40 people with his knees shaking out of fear. And he took a whole eight minutes to give his first sermon. Eight minutes. And he sat down. As he sat down, one elderly man came to him and said, boy, you better go back to school and get a lot more education because you are not going to make it. You're not going to make it. Billy Graham would spend the next several months going in front of alligators, trees, and birds and preaching to the forest. Then he tried out or he applied for military chaplaincy and was immediately declined because they said he didn't have enough ministry experience. Can you imagine the fear of failure, the fear of inability? God, you've called me to this, but I can't get a gig anywhere. Then one night, as he was on his nighttime walk on a golf course, he fell prostrate before God and said, God, if you've, if you've called me to this, I will serve you, but you got to help me. One night, in the middle of nowhere, he surrendered his fears to God and said, God, if you have called me to this, I will serve you. And now today we know him as one of the most influential, impactful people in the world that have ever lived. How is it that Billy Graham, that Moses, that you and I overcome our fear and that we step out of our greatest fear into the great things that God calls you to? Because I believe that there is greatness in your life. No matter what stage of life you're in, God calls his children to incredible, extraordinary things. How is it that Moses overcame his fear and was not defined by his fear. Why is it that today when you think about the great Moses, you don't think about his five excuses of fear. You think about the great exploits he did for God. Well, you find the secret ingredient to Moses' life in Hebrews chapter 11. Where 1,400 years later, the writer of Hebrews gives us a snapshot of Moses. Who he was at the core. And notice what Hebrews 11 verse 23 onwards says. By faith, by faith, Moses, after he was born, was hidden by his parents for three months because they saw that the child was beautiful and they didn't fear the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and chose to suffer with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasure of sin. For he considered reproach for the sake of Christ to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, since he was looking ahead to the reward. By faith, Moses, when he left Egypt behind, not being afraid of the king's anger, for Moses persevered as one who sees him who is invisible. By faith, he instituted the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch the Israelites, by faith, they crossed the Red Sea as though they were on dry land. When the Egyptians attempted to do this, they were drowned. Hallelujah. By faith. Amen. When you peel the curtain back on Moses' life, what you realize is, yes, he had fears. He was afraid what God called him to. But there was something else that coexisted with fear. He had faith. Yes, he was afraid to say yes to God. He had great fears. But there was a faith that was greater than his greatest fear. Moses' entire life from his birth to his end was marked by plenty of reasons to be afraid. But his faith 
was greater than his greatest fear. The way that you overcome fear is this. Fear loses its grip on you and me. When faith exceeds our fear. When our faith in God exceeds our fears in life. Now catch this next sentence. It's so important. Faith is not the absence of fear. Faith is not the absence of fear. Faith takes precedence over fear. See, when I grew up, I thought, man, if I have faith, I'll never be afraid again. Faith and fear can't go together. So if I'm afraid of something, that means I don't have any faith. But what I've realized is that if any time I've taken a step of faith, this something that God called me to do, there was always uncertainties. There was always plenty of reasons to be afraid. But the way that you overcome fear is to let faith exceed fear. Is to have a greater faith in the fears of your life. I want to illustrate this for you this way. Let's imagine that these two vases represent your life. One is fear and one is faith. They both make up who you are as an individual, as a person. The Bible says that when we come to Christ, Romans 12 verse 3 says, God distributes to each person a level of faith. He gives to you faithful daily living. He gives to you and I, each and every one of you, a level of faith. But life also distributes something called fear. As you move through life, get older, go through life experiences, you begin to receive from life fear. Fear of inability. I'm not made for this. Fear of failure. I, I tried to do that small business thing. It didn't work. I tried to finish school. It didn't work. I tried a relationship. And now I'm afraid to even meet a person again. I've tried it over and over again, but I'll never make it through. This is just who I am. Fear of others. How do I have that conversation with my spouse? How do I have that conversation with what God has called me to do? Fear of other people. Fear of the outcome that we don't even know, but we jump to because of how we love Jump to conclusions. Fear of our own identity. I'm not born in the right family. I'm not educated enough. I'm not the person that could really do what God's calling me to do. Fear of the unknown. I have no idea. If I take the step, where would it lead me? As we go through life, man, fear escalates. And actually, fear even compounds. Disappointments, failures begin to build. And you begin to live life based out of fear. And when you live life like this, you view your opportunities, your relationships, all of your life through the lens of fear. So you'll jump to the worst case scenario without even giving the best case scenario a chance. You'll think of the what ifs, not the what could be's. You'll look at only the risk and not the opportunity. And we miss out on the extraordinary things God calls us to because fear has exceeded our faith. Fear has escalated, but our faith has remained the same. And actually, when you get older, I think it's possible that your faith becomes less bold. You've experienced too many failures. You've experienced too many disappointments. There's doubts now in your mind, and your faith could even lessen. It would be amazing if in the Christian life, we could remove fear off the table. It would be awesome if you could just take fear off the picture and just have faith. But that is not the case. Why? Because your heart and my heart has the equal capacity to have faith and to have fear. Your heart, my heart, is capable of having great faith or having great fear. So what's the solution? If you can't remove fear completely out of the picture, what do you do? The only thing to do is increase your level of faith. The only thing to do is grow in your inner man, invest in your faith life so that your faith begins to exceed your fear. How do you do that? The Bible says that we grow in our faith by the hearing and the reading of God's word. When you meditate on God's promises and you let his word speak life over to you and you believe that it's truth and that it's written inspired by Holy Spirit, faith increases. 
when you begin to invest in your personal relationship with Jesus, you begin to carve out that time every day where you're alone with God, faith begins to increase. When you're in a connect group and you do life with other people, meeting regularly to study scripture together, to let other people speak into your life, your faith begins to increase. When you say yes to an opportunity to serve people, to serve in ministry, your faith becomes increasing. When you go to that gospel conversation training and you see that person you feel compelled to share the gospel with and you take that risk and you share the gospel and you see what only God could do, you go on that mission trip, you give your life away, your faith begins to build until your faith has exceeded your fear. Amen. Amen. This is the life God calls you to live. A life of faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to live the life that God calls you to live, to live the marriage you're called to live, to live the career you're called to live. I wonder where today you find yourself in. What's running your life? Faith-based answers or fear-based excuses? How do you respond to life? I want to close by just giving you a few ways when you live with faith exceeding your fears. What does that look like for you individually? What did it look like for Moses in Hebrews 11 that he lived by faith in the midst of fear? Not in spite of it, but in the midst of fear. I think, and it says that Moses' parents saw him by faith. They decided to keep him alive. Despite of what the king's edict was, they said, we saw this child to be beautiful. Faith sees what could be while fear sees only what is. Faith sees what could be, the potential, what could be, while fear sees only what is. They saw this child. Perhaps they thought to themselves, it's worth keeping him alive. Perhaps he is the one that's going to rescue us. Even when he was drawn out of the water, Pharaoh's daughter named him Moses, which means to draw or to lead out. Perhaps there was more than what met the eye. I challenge you this week to see beyond what is to what could be at your job, in your cubicle, in your marriage, in your child's life. Don't just look at what is. Faith looks at what could be in the hands of God. Then by faith, we're told in Hebrews 11, that Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And he embraced the reproach, the struggle of God's people. Faith makes choices out of conviction, while fear adapts to what is convenient. Faith makes choices, decisions out of conviction, while fear sticks to what is convenient. Moses could have luxurily or lived in the cush of Pharaoh's family. He didn't have to lose anything, he didn't have to risk anything. But there was a conviction that said there's more to who I am. Sometimes it takes more faith to say no out of conviction than it does to say yes out of convenience. Faith makes hard choices out of conviction. Then we're told that by faith Moses fled Egypt even though Pharaoh's anger and wrath was behind it. Because he persevered in the wilderness as one who saw him who is invisible. Moses persevered by seeing him who was invisible. Pharaoh was visible. His voice was audible. Pharaoh's anger was seen and felt. But Moses fixed his eyes, not on what was seen, but on what was unseen. He fixed his heart on the invisible one. Faith finds his assurance in the invisible someone, while fear finds its anchor in the visible something. Friends, our faith is not in something, it's in someone. Our faith is not in an outcome, it's in a person named Jesus. Our faith will say, no matter what I see with my physical eyes, I will choose to believe the invisible. Very definition of faith is an assurance of things that are not seen. Faith finds assurance in the invisible someone rather than the visible some things of your life that frighten you. Now we come to the eve of the exodus. And the angel of death is about to pass by to take all of the firstborns in Egypt. We're told that by faith Moses instituted the Passover, the spilling of the blood. 
Imagine this, you're there with your child, your firstborn, and you know that the angel of death is coming for every firstborn in Egypt. I would run. I would get out of Dodge. I would leave Egypt as soon as I could. I would take matters into my own hands. But what you see in that moment of great fear is that faith surrenders to God's unexplainable methods rather than taking matters into our own hands. Faith trusts in, surrenders to God's unexplainable, even illogical sometimes, methods, while fear takes matters into our own hands. It doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand it all, but I am going to surrender to God's unexplainable ways. So they put the blood of the lamb on their doorposts, just trusting that because of the blood, the angel of death would pass by. And it surely did. By faith, they did that. And lastly, as they're on the brink of the Red Sea, as you come to that call of God, that compelling in your heart of hearts, as you come to that hurdle or opportunity, depending on how you look at it, faith insists on obeying God without knowing the outcome, while fear insists on knowing the outcome before obeying God. Faith says, I can obey God without knowing the results, without knowing the outcome, without seeing how it all turns out. While fear says, I have to know the outcome before I take the first step. Fear would say, I got to wait till the Red Sea is split and the ground is dry before I step in it. But faith said, while the ocean is raging, while the sea is clamoring, I'm willing to step in and trust God to make a way where there is no way. I'm willing to step in and trust that God will provide in ways that I don't even know. Faith says I'll take the first step without seeing the whole staircase. I'm willing to take that first step, first leap without seeing how it all turns out. Can I ask you an honest question? If faith was sucked out of your life next week, completely removed. Would it change anything at all? Would it change your daily living? Would it change your habits? Would it change your decision making? If faith was removed from the picture, would it change anything at all? Sometimes I wonder if we really live by faith and every day we wake up saying, God, if you don't come through, there's just no way. But I trust that you will come through. See, I want you to lean in. What's on the line is this. When we as believers live faith-filled lives, the world will see a faithful God. When we live lives full of faith, the world sees a faithful God. When we give God our faith over our fear, the world meets the faithfulness, the goodness, the grace, the kindness of God. Because in that moment, they will see his ability over our inability. They will see that who he is is far greater than who we are not. They will see that as believers, our lives are completely unexplainable by any other means but God. When we live lives full of faith, faith faith-filled lives, the world sees a faithful God. And I imagine if all of those in our room and all of our members at Sugar Creek live like that, What an impact they would have in their neighborhood, in their workplace. What a visible sense of God's faithfulness the world will see if we chose to respond not to our fear, but to respond in faith. Would you bow your heads with me? What have you said no to simply out of fear? Simply because you don't know the whole story, it doesn't all make sense to you. Because you're afraid to take that next step. Where has fear brought you to? Make today the day that you have a Mount Hora moment. Where at the end of your rope, in your last resort, you have a meeting place with God. And while you are honest about your fears, you surrender it for a greater faith than your fear. Maybe you're here and you're under the sound of my voice and you're far from God. 
I just ask you today, will you take that step of faith and surrender your life to Jesus? Say, Jesus, I give you all of my inhibitions, all of my questions, all of my fears. I give it to you. I promise you, my friend, today he'll change your life forever. Would you pray with me? Father, we acknowledge that fear is real. There's so many things in our past, present, and future that cause us great fear. But I thank you that your Holy Spirit raises the level of our faith. That your scriptures, the experiences of our life, the stories of faith increase our faith. So let it be so today. As people of God, that we respond not out of fear. We are not crippled by our fear. But we are marked with great, audacious, bold faith. That our faith would exceed our fear. That we would live lives only explainable by our faith and confidence in God. There is someone here, God, that needs to take that first step and give their life to you. Make it today to join this church, to be a part of this faith community. God, we give you our lives. We give you our fails, our fears, and our failures so that you could do something extraordinary in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.